Hi everyone, welcome to lecture. We're gonna talk in this part about dietary vitamins. And we're gonna start off like always talking about our daily vitamin needs. So first let's talk about how vitamins are grouped or classified. Vitamins are typically classified by functionality or their chemical characteristics. So the most popular or common way to classify them is that it's based on solubility. So there are the commonly known fat soluble vitamins and there are the water soluble vitamins. And again, this just refers to their emissibility or mixability with water. And this is important in biological systems because our blood and our cells are water-based. So how fats are processed and the functions of them are very much dependent on these solid solubility characteristics. Vitamins can be also grouped by their family members. For instance, we're all familiar with vitamin A, but we've also heard of terms like carotenoids and lycopenes and retinol and retinal and all of the different biological family members that belong in the class of vitamin A. So several vitamins have many different vitamins. Up here it's showing an example also of vitamin E. There's actually eight different stereoisometric configurations for vitamin E because there are alpha and gamma and all kinds of other configurations so that there are different biological forms, some being more and less biologically active in humans, which is why it's important to look at their classifications when we talk about our daily needs. So the vitamin intake guidelines are set forth in the DRI. So the dietary reference intakes for vitamins are split up into four different books and they kind of take a functional approach, but it doesn't fit perfectly into that mold, but they have vitamin A and K in a book, vitamin B vitamin group in a book, vitamin C, E, and the carotenoids, which I'm assuming are the antioxidant groups in one book. And then vitamin D is included in its own book separately with some of the different dietary minerals. So I'm not quite sure the strategy. It might've even been the order in which the research was conducted, um, which is something interesting I didn't mention the vitamins are named in the order that they were discovered um, and then the sub vitamins of course B1, B2, B3 in the order they were discovered. Um, so anyways the DRI is split up into several books but in summation there are EAR values which we remember are the estimated average requirements. Those are extrapolated into RDAs which is the term we're most familiar with and that we see on our facts panels but these RDAs we have them for 10 vitamins and minerals of the 13. So the other three kind of jumping ahead they only have established adequate intake values. So these EARs or RDA values for these vitamins are established by research. And in the case of vitamin A, we would look at functional needs and functional declines with and without vitamin A in the diet. So as we'll learn through this lecture, vitamin A is needed for proper vision and um, light triggers that reaction. And so we were able to do research to see how much vitamin A is needed to allow that to perfectly work. Um, we also know that in research, we know the amount of vitamin C that's needed. It's a little different for men and women. And we also have guidelines for smokers because of the additional oxidative damage to consume an extra 35 milligrams of vitamin C. So like I mentioned, the other couple vitamins also only have adequate intake values, meaning that the average calorie intake healthy adult man and woman that takes in about this much of this nutrient generally healthy status and disease free, they take in about this much vitamin K and water soluble vitamin pantothenic acid or B5. Um, dietary guidelines for Americans, just this latest iteration that was recently published emphasizes still that we may be um, needing to do more research and more promotion to get people to increase A and C, which are from fruits and vegetables, um, D because of our use of sun filters and protections and more clothing, and, and which is great for skin cancer purposes, but it, did, it limited our um, vitamin D synthesis and then vitamin E. So we also know that there are behavioral vitamin E's, meaning that we sometimes Sometimes our dietary influence is impacted by the things that we think um, or the environmental influences that impact our foods and the way that we perceive vitamins and our need for them. Um, so for instance, individuals have goals related to all sorts of different factors for health, like immunity, bone health, energy, heart health, you name it, you can find a vitamin product or supplement with a claim related to it. And we'll spend some time um, in section three and four and in some of the practice activities doing just that. 
the external controls for vitamins in the environment are significant because the FDA requires that food companies supplement or enrich or fortify their flours. So when we take grains and we melt them into flours, they have to add those nutrients back. And this is a huge source of our B vitamins in our diet, as well as vitamin C in the case of like breakfast cereals, which we all love. So also milk. Milk is one of those things that when we took the fat out of it to make low fat versions, which is healthy for the population, we took those fat soluble vitamins out. So now the government requires that they fortify or add them back in. So that impacts our daily vitamin intake. Also seeing our need for vitamin D and the changes in our behavior and the use of sunscreen, we now have on the label a requirement about added vitamin D. And the reason that they required vitamin D is one, because we need it and so they're calling attention to it, which again perceives how much we need of it, but this is for people who don't get enough sunshine. Um, but vitamin D also is important on the label because they're also requiring that they label whether it's synthetic or, um, or I'm sorry, plant or animal version like D3 or D2, which again, We'll talk about more in the food component. So marketing for vitamins also influences our opinion, um, but there are actually some legit qualified claims for functions in the human body for both vitamin D, calcium, and calcium's in the mineral lecture, my bad, vitamin D, but they go together, um, and folic acid. And by the way, we will clarify any kind of confusion that you would have about the connection with vitamin D and bone health and calcium in this lecture. Um, so folic acid, there are also claims about that and neural tube defects, which I, we'll talk more about that in this section on reproduction and pregnancy and the need for folic acid in that way. Um, we also know that there's lots of vitamin claims in terms of their content, so good source of, excellent source of, and we see that so much with vitamin C, um, it's crazy. There are also unregulated and undefined claims and kind of ties to this one. This is a little exorbitant and I could say a million reasons why, but for one, it says that um, the result is a food-based formula. This is literally like a little powder capsule, so just a funny thing that people would read and it has some scientific language. but. It's silly, but related to that is in immunity and vitamin C's role in immunity and why vitamin C is so tied to immunity. So vitamin C is a very healthy vitamin and we will talk about it, but the mismarketing of what vitamin C's function is in immunity um, is very misleading on marketing and, and um, used in advertising. So we'll talk more about that again and when we look at the processing um, and the roles of vitamins. So the sources of dietary vitamins in our diet include plants and animals, um, but we're going to start by talking about whole foods that are not processed. And I haven't mentioned it yet, surprisingly, but one of my favorite facts about vitamins is the teeny tiny little quantity in which they are needed in a day. So we're talking about amounts that are as light as like a little baby down feather on a bird or the total weight of all vitamins in one day is the weight of two contact lenses or about 40 milligrams. That's also as heavy as like half of a tooth pet okay so we're not talking about a lot we're talking about a very small amount um, we get also we can look at the different vitamin groups just again highlighting all of the different families or vitamins for retinol vitamin e vitamin d also there's the d2 d3 forms like i said so it looks complicated when you're researching like the um, vitamin content of a food and you get something an analysis that's this thorough there are so many vitamin families um, which is again why we're kind of unraveling the confusion of the subject of nutrition it's not always straightforward because there are a million different names for all of these simple vitamins different versions of folate um, but point is is that they are different affected by time and temperature so basically cooking and um, you know spoilage and maturity so fat soluble vitamins actually they're enhanced their bioavailability with cooking and heat and time and water soluble vitamins are destroyed so they have more losses like vitamin C and folate those vitamins tend to be less in a cooked final product whereas the fat soluble vitamins sometimes their bioavailability is enhanced with cooking um, so that's an interesting thing about how it affects the amount of vitamins in our foods we also have a lot of vitamins that are added to foods as preservatives um, for taste to create that nice little tartness that we need in our trigeminal nerve um, and then also for fortification purposes people really want to write on that little gummy bear thing like an excellent source of vitamin c because they knew that they needed it for taste and preservation and nice that color um, so they might as well go ahead and add a little more to make that claim um, and people will buy it because of that um, we also know that some vitamins are sensitive to light and oh my god i have to go faster this is going to be like two hours long but for instance like milk the riboflavin in milk which is vitamin b2 um, milk used to be packaged 
in glass. And then they saw that that was destroying all the riboflavin. So they started putting it in the opaque and the paper carton containers that we know now. Um, plants, great source of vitamins, but we have seen some innovations in the world of plants. Um, for instance, vitamin A rich bananas and the picture below vitamin A rich, rich rice. Um, in fact, the vitamin A rich rice is a product called golden rice and it's been popular for years. It was developed in China and it is a literally an excellent source of vitamin A, which rice was you know void of before, um, but because of a million that I couldn't explain why, but political, social and economic reasons, golden rice isn't in the food supply. Um, so people are afraid of biotechnology. And even when they're not, there are political ramifications to people that own the patents and whatever. It's a confusing, convoluted topic. But the point is, is they've done innovations to make foods more vitamin rich, vitamin A particularly, because that one's a problem in other countries as it relates to blindness. So fruits, we're looking at vitamin A and vitamin C, something like a kiwi or a red bell pepper is gonna satisfy 100%. So anytime you see these circles, they're kind of to note um, how much of the proportion of our daily need is all, um, represented. So we're gonna get a, all of our needs for vitamin C in servings of kiwis and red peppers and about three quarters in a serving of citrus fruit, like orange or even a serving of strawberries. So these are excellent sources of vitamin C. Um, vitamin A, we also get a lot of vitamin A in our fruits, like tomatoes, which I know we traditionally botanically think of as a vegetable, but fruits include tomatoes and they are really high in vitamin A. But interestingly, not the overall amount of vitamin A, but one of the vitamins, one of the vitamin A family members, lycopene. And so interestingly, ketchup was one of the pioneers of that claim, um, one of those functional claims about being high in lycopene, where we started seeing like phytochemicals and functional nutrients being marketed. So ketchup and tomatoes kind of go together with that lycopene, but excellent source um, for what we need vitamin A for. Vegetables. So vegetables, we're also talking about A and C, but we also oddly see vitamin K in vegetables. And like I mentioned, we synthesize vitamin K in our intestines. And so as we'll get to, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, but we see vitamin K in meat products because they have intestines. And so sometimes those products are processed into the things that we eat. And so we get vitamin K from meat, but we also get it from leafy greens. Um, back to the whole concept of vitamin A, we also get vitamin A in vegetables. And in this form, we're getting actually overall lots of vitamin A, but also a different vitamin. We're getting beta carotene. And so this one has a lot of carotene and lutein. And interestingly, I included the data up here for raw and cooked uh, because the raw carrot has less of those active bioactive, you know, carotenoids than uncooked versions. So with cooking it's all, or with carrots, it's all good to cook. And in fact, for any kind of carotenoid rich um, vegetable like sweet potatoes. Um, vitamin C, excellent in kale and in broccoli, both of those providing anywhere from 75 to 50% of our daily values. Um, and then we, like I mentioned with kale, it provides a good portion. Now, not all of this is probably bioavailable, but it provides an excellent source of vitamin K. One cup of kale provides, you know, two to three times the RDA for it, or not RDA, adequate intake. There's only an adequate intake for K. Um, grains. Grains are an excellent source of the B vitamins, particularly pyridoxin or vitamin B6 and vitamin E. So a serving of quinoa will take about a quarter of our day's needs out of the way, and a serving of wild rice will take about a quarter of our day's needs for B6. But I didn't include much more because grains aren't all together all to do the source of vitamins. Now, what you're probably asking yourself is, well, what about cereals? We haven't got to processed foods. We're just talking about whole foods, whole grains, things that haven't been processed into other products. Um, nuts, seeds, beans, and legumes. So sunflower seeds, excellent best nut and be or best seed for vitamin E content. And as we will get to in a moment, so are its oils. Um, almonds are also a pretty good source, satisfying about half of our daily needs. Um, peas are also, which is a legume, is also a great source of vitamin C, as is edamame. In fact, edamame is the best source of folate um, outside of fortified sources. It's like the best whole natural food folate food source, but it's not that bioavailable. So even though its folate content is high, its bioavailability is relatively low. Um, so I think I just kind of, yeah, I, I got ahead of myself on that. So folate, this shows the amount total versus the amount that's actually available to us in terms of the equivalents for folate, which again, are divided by a factor that considers that plant sources just aren't as concentrated as the kind that we'll get from folic acid. So animals, animals have a good amount of vitamins to offer in the diet also, particularly the fat soluble vitamins A and D and B vitamins B12 or cobalamin and B3. 
liver. Liver is the best source of vitamins and super concentrated in vitamin A and vitamin D. So is fish. Fish is the most concentrated source of vitamin D per you know unit of weight. Um, mussels and mollusks and clamfish in general are really concentrated sources of B12 as are meats. And so a steak will provide not only B12, but not as much as it does B3, but about a quarter of the amount for B12, but half the daily needs for vitamin B3 are provided in a single, you know, three ounce serving of steak. So meats are providing a lot in the range of fat and water soluble vegetables. Now milk is one of those interesting ones like flowers, which we haven't gotten to, but that it's fortified. And so we left up here to show you the difference between a fortified and a non-fortified milk in the content of retinol and the content of colocalciferol, which is vitamin A, and vitamin D. Those are the two that are required to be added to milk. And then vitamin B12 and riboflavin or vitamin B2 are both naturally high in milk. And so just one glass serves half of the daily needs for both those two. So milk is important in the diet, which is why we promote it to kids and to all everybody of all ages, but pregnant women, but anyone in stages of growth, because it's certain to help contribute to meeting your daily needs for many of those vitamins. So vitamins in processed and formulated foods, fats and oils. So we're seeing tons of vitamin E coming from sunflower seeds, like I mentioned. So the oils that it derives are also high in vitamin E. But interestingly, other oils aren't necessarily high in the active form of vitamin E. So oils are always gonna give us vitamin E, which is why no one's deficient in it in the United States. But sunflower oil particularly is high in the biologically active alpha tocopherol. And lots of other oils have much higher concentrations of inactive gamma tocopherols or other types that we aren't you can see all seven of them I won't say them because it's chemistry jargon but they're inaccessible to us biologically so sunflower oil best source of um, biological available vitamin E margarine is an excellent source of vitamin D and we even see it's a really good source of vitamin K so that hydrogenation process makes vitamin K and in vitamin D scenarios, it's added. So we're always looking for it to be form D3, which is the kind we want, not D2. And there's been a lot of food regulation and labeling involved in getting everybody to use active vitamin D3, but a cheaper version D2 used to be used. So when we talk about vitamin D and margarine, just be keen to that you're looking for D3. We'll talk about that more um, in another area. Um, flowers and meals, they're also fortified with the B vitamins. And I just put up here per 100 grams because it isn't feasible to talk about a serving size per flower. It's not like we go to our pantry and like get a quarter cup of it and eat it. So per 100 grams, just for relative comparison of the amount of folic acid, niacin, thiamine, and riboflavin, which is B1 through B3 and folate, just to see the amount of the, the, those vitamins that are satisfied per day per 100 grams. And you can see the difference between whole, which is less than enriched, but which is like really way more than the non-enriched strip version. So you've got this probably perfectly balanced um, seed that you have stripped of everything which is the bottom row and then we fortify it back to be better than ever um, which I don't know how I feel about because it's the reason we don't have vitamin B deficiencies and neural tube defects which we'll get to with pregnancy but it's also we had something good before we made it a little softer and more bakeably delicious <laughs> um, supplemental nutrition products so we also take and isolate little things in foods to extract out of them their lovely properties with the vitamins like wheat germ is an excellent source of folate and vitamin e or like we mentioned with liver fish liver excellent source of those fat soluble vitamins a and d and even in weird things that we don't really associate too much with vitamins but like spices that we would use on foods like turmeric excellent source of carotenoids like those vitamin a family members so packaged products, bottled beverages have lots of added vitamins, again, for taste, tart, pop preservation, it balances with sweet. So lots in these juice products, we always see them in concentrates. Um, we also see them in energy products because they're related to energy claims, which we'll talk about in component four. Processed grains. So we think that processed grains do provide a lot of added vitamins, which they do, but you can see that breads and pastas aren't where we're getting it from necessarily. Breads and pastas, all together as we add them up in the diet, as we have two slices of bread, maybe four times a week, if we eat sandwiches for lunch, then it starts really adding up to contribute. Uh, but in terms of like one serving, it's all about breakfast cereals. 100% of the daily values for all of these B vitamins and including vitamin E 
are provided in cereal. So cereal, they really do a good job of making sure that it is um, enriched and fortified, which is again why we promote it for youth and for pregnancy and even older folks who just need those, make sure to get those extra vitamins. Um, we, get the, we get vitamins and condiments and sauces. Again, tomato products have lycopene, like I mentioned with vegetables or fruit um, and ketchup. And we see those oils that are used in dressings contribute plenty of vitamin E. Dietary supplements, and this is the last part on food sources. I apologize, this is long, but um, dietary supplements. Fat-soluble vitamins are provided in the diet by these supplements, and people take vitamin K. And really all I'm pointing out to you here is I'm not hoping that you memorize the different vitamins of K because we haven't really you know, introduced them. It's not that high level, but this is active form K2. And so this is a more biologically active form than the kind we would get in the kale, right? Um, we also know that vitamin E, I, we talked many times about the vitamins, well, a couple times, um, about the different vitamins in the vitamin E family. And you can see right here, this one's silly because it's literally promoting that they have not only alpha tocopherol, which is the one that's biologically available to us, but also the other seven that aren't. <laughs> they like list them on there all proud, but it's just a consumer confusion mechanism. Um, vitamin D, you can see right there, big and proud. They've got that D3 really pulled out to let the consumer know that it's that biologically active form. And then lutein. So you're not going to usually see a plain old vitamin vitamin A supplement, occasionally you do, it's for old timers who understand, but usually they're more tied to like beta carotene, lutein, lycopene, because people think that those, um, you know, the carotenoid versions, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the carotenoids, the pre-carotenoids are better for supplementing and they are, and we'll talk about that in the imbalance section, but you can over consume vitamin A easy. So most of the time these supplements are very much making sure we understand that it's from plant sources like lutein and beta carotene, and it's one that you won't over consume as easily like retinol from plants that's super from animals that one is very bioavailable um we also know that water soluble vitamins come in supplement form look at how much vitamin c comes in these products um there's a fun practice activity in the vitamin section that looks at a research study that makes you glance at a research study about who funds it and what they own and i think it was emergency if i remember right but one of these mega vitamin c products um, vitamin B12, cobalamin, again, just to kind of show you about the amount they prescribe, and then they're bioactive. This one's methyl, this one's methylated already. And in the next section, we'll talk about what that is and why we need B12 in the diet, but it's involved in methylation. And so you can see that they already methylate it for you, so it's nice and bioavailable. Um, lots of vitamin supplements for B12 are marketed vegan safe, and that's because that's one of the only nutrients that are like exclusively from meat sources. And so people that are vegan and vegetarian just sometimes don't get enough. So usually B vitamins are like vegan. They'll say that somewhere on them, usually. Not all of them. Um, folic acid is also something that we see, but I just put this up here to, so that you could see two things. One, folic acid supplements provide 100% of the daily values. Like the rest of these provide, you know, 50, 60, 70. 70%, but folic acid is one of those ones that it gives you 100% of it. Number two is that it's always folic acid. If we haven't, if I haven't said exactly yet all the vitamins in the folate family, it's folate, which is food folate, natural folate, and folic acid, which is the kind that's added to foods. You're always going to see synthetic folic acid on supplements because it's more bioavailable. Why would we put natural food folate extracted from food when we could use the more bioavailable chemical synthetic version? Um, so folic acid, you'll always see that that is the form for vitamin supplements and methylated folate again like b12 it's involved in methylation reactions and so we're going to go ahead and methylate it for you and not saying if that's effective or not but it's methylated folate because it's supposedly more bioavailable and more prepared to do what it does and a B-complex vitamin. And this is called the complex because they usually come together. It's not too often that you see vitamins like B, vitamin B1 all by itself or thiamine supplements. Usually you see B supplements sold together as a complex. So that was the longest section. Now we're gonna go on and talk a little briefly and a little bit more broadly about vitamin processing because really vitamins aren't processed the same way that macronutrients are in that they are like broken down, catabolized, built up and stored. The processes are, are more simple. They have these like functional contributions that they make, but they aren't as like catabolic or anabolic. Um, they also aren't in need of as much um, breaking down during the digestive process. So it's basically an overview for everything until we get to the functions of vitamins. Uh, because again, they're kind of directly contributing right away. They're not really needing to be processed much. Um, but for fun, to walk us through our regular outline, we have obviously bile is important. So the liver makes it, the gallbladder holds it, 
bile is needed to emulsify fats, which allows fat soluble vitamins to be absorbed. So they move through the stomach, the cells of the stomach release what's called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is in blue because it's a protein. If you haven't picked up the color theme yet, today's purple, which is why I have a little teeny bit of purple. It's not my favorite color. Um, and mauve, I could deal with that. Uh, but intrinsic factor is blue because it's a protein that's made by the parietal cells of the stomach and it binds to B12 so that it can be absorbed. Also, we have the hydrochloric acid secretion, which allows protein bound vitamins showing there to be hydrolyzed or freed, liberated from protein so that they can be absorbed soon in the small intestine. In the small intestine, obviously that emulsification process happens for fat soluble vitamins. And then as they're absorbed, B12 bound to intrinsic factor is brought in through active transport. I clearly couldn't go over with you guys the mechanisms for every single vitamin. I just concluded B12 because it does have this one little difference in that it is bound to B12 and it requires sodium. So it's like facilitated, it's active, it takes energy. Um, absorbing B12 takes our body a bit of work. Um, they're absorbed straight through by portal B12 or cobalamin, straight through to the portal route um, by the hepatic or the liver circulation. Um, the fat soluble vitamins, again, they're with fat, they're taken into the enterocyte, packaged into a chylomicron, just like fats, and they're absorbed through the lymph system because they're bigger and bulkier. Um, then there again, yeah, that was a lot of a lot of overanimation there. In the large intestine, we have bacteria that produce a number of vitamins, mainly being vitamin K because this is our primary biological source. Um, but we also have a little bit of folate produced by the large intestine as well as B5. And the reason they produce folate and B5 is because they do energy respiration just like we do. So they have a little bit of folate and B5 that they're interchanging in their. Um, sustenance of energy. Those microbes are just like we are metabolically in terms of their oxidative capacities. Um, so, well, not just like we are, but you get it. Um, vitamins are also transported in the blood. They're transported in the water, as in the water soluble ones. The fat soluble ones are transported in the lymph, just like that, because why? They're not immiscible. They're not mixable in the regular water-based blood. So they travel around in those chylomicrons, just like fats do, or long chain fats do. Just like, also like long chain fats, those chylomicrons go off and drop these vitamins off at target tissues. Primarily the skin for vitamin D, which vitamin D is, travels to the skin where it's activated, and we'll talk more about the function of that later, but it's activated for use in calcium and bone health. We also see vitamin D go to the renal area and activate another hormone, calcitriol, so that it also plays a role in calcium homeostasis and bone health. So vitamin D is taken to those areas and processed kind of, I would call it more like activated. Um, vitamin A is taken to the eyes or the photoreceptor cells where it is integrated into cell membranes and they're dropped off all along. Vitamin E is dropped off in all the tissues until the remnant, just like fat, goes back to the liver. And the liver is able to process and store the majority of these fat soluble vitamins until they're needed elsewhere in which it's packaged from the liver and sent back out for needs, say at the eye or the skin or at the renal level. So vitamin storing tissues, like we mentioned, the liver cells or the hepatocytes are pretty good at storing tissues. We could have called this one a regular like anabolic metabolism, but I didn't really want to say it was directly that um, because it's just this temporary storing. You know, vitamin A is esterified or kind of like kind of like glycogen, I guess it's you know kind of tightly bound together. Um, vitamin E is converted to synthetic forms, or not synthetic forms, it's converted to its active biological forms, and their storage form for vitamin K and the B vitamins. So a little bit deep in level, but the hepatic area or the liver is where most of that is done. The proliferative tissues include the bone marrow and the integumentary system or the skin. In both of these areas, or areas, the vitamin need is very high. And because of single carbon methylation reactions, this is how these tissues rapidly divide and differentiate. So folate, vitamin B12, travel to these areas. They're taken into the bone marrow and keratinocytes or skin cells. They're used in methylation reactions, which we'll talk about the functions of that in component four, but that's the way that those areas reproduce or proliferate so quickly. So the need for those vitamins are high in those tissues particularly. Vitamin degrading tissues are where we're taking vitamins and breaking them down for use include the ocular system. The retinal eye at the eye area is using vitamins as it is triggered to by light and it is isomerizing it or changing the chemical configuration so that lights can see so that they can adapt to being in the dark.
the integumentary system or the skin cells, they actually convert vitamin D from its inactive to its active form so that it's, it, it's able to go and activate the kidneys. And the kidneys are part of the urinary system, but in this capacity, the kidneys produce a hormone called calcitriol that's activated by vitamin D, which is the point of bone, uh, bone density, which we'll get to in just a second. Vitamins are also used in the cells in their electron chain transport processes or oxidative phosphorylation. So they act as electron carriers during these electron transport processes to produce ATP. And I know we've talked about oxidative phosphorylation many times, but you can recognize the picture and see each vitamin and their role in each of these separate pathways. So the functions of processing dietary vitamins are at the cell, tissue, and whole body level. And they also include all of the areas from structure, energy, and operational functions. Um, I hesitate on the energy one because it made sense to put vitamins with energy, but their role there is as enzyme catalysts, and I have been so far putting that in the operational area. So um, we're going a little outside of our organizational um, repetition for this section, but just stick with me. So vitamins are integral to human body structures. We've mentioned it a couple times, but they're integrated as rhodopsin into the membranes of eye cells. So we know what cell membranes are. We know there are fats there. We know there are proteins and glycans there. We've talked about those in previous lessons. Now we also know there are vitamins integrated into that membrane also. There stored there and they also contribute to the functionality of the membrane but we need that structurally in that cell we also know vitamins contribute to energy as coenzymes so when we convert or catabolize nutrients and we turn that into energy used to rephosphorylate ATP we need these vitamin coenzymes they need were they need These vitamins have particular features that allow them to carry electrons or reduce compounds and oxidize compounds in this back and forth process that allows our body to do the electron transport chain, which you can see showing in the picture. So vitamins are needed in energy respiration or the resynthesis of ATP. Now, again, I hesitated about putting this one with energy as opposed to putting it in the operation section because it is a catalytic and enzyme role. Um, and more about the enzymatic and gene functions and protective functions of vitamins we will discuss here. So lots and lots of genetic um, features for vitamins. Number one, cellular levels of vitamin D influence the amount of gene expression for certain gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal pumps. So what you're looking at is the pumps for calcium absorption, both the paracellular ones and the you know, through the cell ones. Paracellular means between the cells. So you're looking at the way calcium is absorbed. Vitamin D increases the expression of those protein pumps. So the more vitamin D is around, the more that we produce those gastrointestinal pumps for calcium absorption. This is the first piece of how vitamin D is super strongly related to bone density and bone health because we need calcium and the way that we mineralize our bones is calcium. How do we get calcium in the body? It's not very bioavailable. We need vitamin D to produce more of those pumps so that we can bring more in. Vitamin D also, the levels of that in the blood or the serum is needed to activate calcitriol, like we just said, that hormone. That calcitriol is needed for a number of things, but fast forwarding for calcium homeostasis. We'll talk about that in the next lecture, but calcitriol is involved with the parathyroid and that makes sure our calcium and our bone is perfect. And so vitamin D is critical because vitamin D is needed for that calcitriol. Um, vitamin E is another one that is needed for operations because the levels of vitamin E in the cell contribute to the expression of this particular protein protocyclin, which is involved in vascular tone. So for us to have contractility of our vessels and you know relaxation and contraction of our blood vessels for regulating blood pressure, we need vitamin E. Um, vitamin C, I love vitamin C because it has many functions, but always like slightly confused for people. Vitamin C, the concentrations of that in the cell promotes gene expression of connective tissue. So we all know this relationship because we've seen the stories about the sailors on the ships and scurvy and we've seen that. Um, when you don't have vitamin C, I'm, I'm fast forwarding to component five, but yeah, your skin starts falling apart. And that's its relationship to connective tissue. It's needed for the genomic expression or so for the genes to be produced. But it is also needed because it is 
is a coenzyme, meaning it sits in the coenzyme to kind of like activate it structurally, assist with it, whatever you want to call it. It's a coenzyme for the cross-linking in collagen. So not only is its concentration helpful with connective tissue production, gene-wise, but also it is needed for an enzyme that allows collagen specifically to cross-link. And without tight collagen cross-linking, you don't have strong connective tissues and you can be lightly deficient in C. Again, I'm getting ahead, but your gums just bleed easily because you don't have strong collagen cross-linking. And so, um, long story short, ascorbic acid is needed for the hydroxylation of these two amino acids in their collagen cross-linking. So vitamin C, critical for in here, the connective tissue collagen role, and we'll talk in a minute about its role in inflammation or antioxidant. Um, cobalamin. Why, or the why didn't you just talk about that right here? Because we're still talking about coenzyme and catalytic features of vitamins. So cobalamin or vitamin B12 is a cofactor for an enzyme called methionine synthase, okay? So methionine synthase is needed in conjunction with the methylation of homocysteine. I know this is complicated, pause and rewind. The methylation of homocysteine requires folate. So in conjunction with the methylation of homocysteine by folate, the amino acid and, um, or I'm sorry, the enzyme methionine synthase is needed to can make methionine. And if you guys remember from the protein lecture, what does methionine do? Methionine is the amino acid that it starts all of the genetic processes for protein synthesis and particularly for hemopoietic ones like red blood cells, proteins for blood clotting, and yes, back to collagen. So anywho, and immunity, because those are also hemopoietic proteins. And I know I'm getting way ahead of myself. I was supposed to just touch on the concept here that folate and B12 are needed in the basically boiling down to, you can call it for methylation reactions, but that's component three stuff. What it's needed for is to produce methionine. And methionine is an essential amino acid that we need to make hemopoietic proteins. Um, vitamin E and vitamin C, their functional roles are protective. So now we've kind of moved on from the catalytic features. And if you notice, we still haven't touched on how vitamin C is related to immunity. That's just my favorite thing. Cause it's just, my mom's always like, did you get your vitamin C? Um, I think I've told you guys this, but we got COVID. Um, and it was just the, everybody was like, have you been getting vitamin C? And I was laughing. I'm like, we definitely are good on vitamin C, but we always are. Like if we were deficient on vitamin C, that'd be a fair question. But I'm like, you guys know we're adequate on vitamin C because everybody knows me and my vitamin C. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, I'm getting sloppy at the end here. Um, so vitamin E and vitamin C act as cellular antioxidants. And what they do is they take these reactive oxygen species, gnarly little fang guys, and they, oops, and they, oxidize them. And what that means is they let a donate, they let it have an electron. They donate an electron to that free radical or that unstable molecule. And that produces a non-reactive product. And this is what your cell wants because that reactive oxygen species is just that. It's reactive, it's gnarly, it's causing damage, it's bouncing around and causing damage on the membrane, on mitochondria. It's just bad for all your little cell organelles. So vitamin E donates that electron, stabilizes or neutralizes it, and now it's not toxic anymore. And then vitamin C in turn, not only can vitamin C do that, it can also donate an electron or oxidize it, but vitamin C also recycles or regenerates or re-oxidizes that tocopherol dimer back to alpha tocopherol. So it re-donates its electrons. So they're involved in these redox, which is a combination of reduce and oxidize, redox, get it? Um, oxidation reduction reactions all day between vitamin C and vitamin E, and that keeps our cell nice and neutralized from these bad free radicals that are just produced produced naturally. And we'll talk more about that in the disease section. We're going to talk in this last component about vitamin status or imbalances or aberrant intake in vitamin daily that creates different clinical, biochemical, anthropometric, and other types of manifestations. So vitamins can be toxic at really high levels of intake, like you know, superseding the 95th, 97th, 98th percentile of the population, we do see toxic effects for certain vitamins. Vitamin A, at just three times the level of the recommended daily intake, we see that it can be toxic. And folate, even a smaller amount, two and a half times the daily intake can create toxic effects. And most specifically, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but the problem with overdoing it on folate is that you oftentimes like miss other deficiencies. Folate masks deficiencies of other important vitamins. So we also see that certain energy nutrients like B3, that's niacin, that one's the most common in 
like energy drinks. Um, it's also in a lot of detox products. Like if you've ever known anybody that needed to do like a like a marijuana test, they're loaded with niacin, and it's because it like creates this masking effect to the THC compound. And I'm not sure if it works or not. All I know is that if you take those products, those are the cases where we see like crazy niacin, and it's just itchy. Like it's like a kind of like a rashy allergic reaction. Um, but the point is, is yes, vitamins can be toxic in certain high level amounts, but nothing that's caused by dietary intake. These are all things coming from supplemental intake products that are like specifically formulated to have a lot and then over consuming those. We also see that sometimes vitamins, we can be deficient in them. Now, in the United States, because of fortification and enrichment programs, and because we aren't really deficient in macronutrient intake, so we get oils, we get basically all the food groups in a way um, that we're not really deficient on many nutrients. And these nutrients, A, D, C, and folate, are ones that we, if we really looked hard and measured, that people would most commonly under consume. Um, now in other countries, significant problems. Pre, um, prenatal supplementation, or <laughs> before prenatal supplementation, folate, huge problem. Um, pre-sunscreen, vitamin D, never a problem. Um, so it, you know, these evolve and change as things happen in society and depending where you live, but there are deficiencies in vitamin A, folate, vitamin D, and C most often that relate to some of the, um, you know, physical manifestations that we'll talk about next in the assessments. So we can make these measurements and figure out different um, ways to assess vitamin status by looking at different measures. Anthropometric measures, for instance, bone density. So if you do not get enough vitamin D, it affects your bone density. So low bone density scores anywhere from a, you know, 2.5 to 4 is osteoporosis and this isn't the talk on disease, but low vitamin D intake over time is related to osteoporosis and general low bone density, which you can see um, on the grades or scoring. Biochemical measures are also ways to assess vitamin status. For instance, in the case of low vitamin B12 or low folate intake, you have an abnormal red blood cell synthesis. So abnormal hemopoietoesis, however you say that word, but abnormal production of red blood cells. And this creates red blood cells that are macrocytic, hyperchromic, different colors, different sizes, but long story short, abnormal. They don't carry oxygen effectively. So people with B12 and folate deficiencies develop anemias and regardless of the types the important concept is that they are you're unable to deliver oxygen and so you're generally clinically fatigued and low energy and tired um, we also know like I mentioned before that excess intake of nutrients can sometimes just mask other deficiencies particularly in the case of you know vegan diets they may be deficient in b12 masked by consuming fortified grain products that are over doing it in b9 or folate. Um, biochemical specimen that we can sometimes use to assess vitamin status includes urine because urine is the way that we determine, I guess I didn't mention this in component one and should have, but we determined our water soluble vitamin needs because they are very easily traced. They make your blood serum levels go up and then they make your urinary concentrations go up. So we have this increased blood concentration and then they are excreted. So easy to kind of see what we need, what the thresholds are and what we eliminate. Um, but we can measure in our urine or the blood for water soluble vitamins and kind of look at um, if there's none in the blood and in the urine that means we're conserving them and there may be a deficiency clinical measures there are so many clinical conditions linked to vitamin deficiencies um, lots of research on people that are vitamin C deficient have diarrhea and it's probably because of the integrity of those gastrointestinal cells the connective tissues um, they don't adequately absorb water um, I'm not positive um, I have to say but lots of research with vitamin C deficiencies and diarrhea um, vitamin A if you don't get enough of that it can lead to and for unknown reasons headache and general fatigue and lethargy Lots of neurological symptoms tied to vitamin B deficiencies. And these are old clinical things like burning feet syndrome. These are things like during war, like soldiers in, you know, barracoons would, I don't think barracoons is the right, barricade. You guys, if you've ever been in the military, sorry, I don't know how to say that word, but they're in the hole and they're not eating appropriately and they're not taking their vitamin supplements. Um, they have things like burning feet syndrome, itchy things, neurological things, basically confusion and dizziness that are related to severe vitamin deficiencies. So neurological problems, um, changes in appearance, most notably and the most popular, I think, is if you've ever known anyone that's been on like a carrot diet, it was probably a thing in my day in the 90s, but 
people would turn yellow. I knew a girl that ate carrot and pretzels every day, and for sure, I was like, dude, you're looking a little orange. I was already kind of interested in nutrition at that point, but so there are cases where it builds up in your pigment. It's fat soluble and it sticks around in your membranes, and so it can turn your pigment different colors. Lots of different changes in hair and skin with vitamins, but there's just too many to rattle off. But you guys can take a look at that and have that as a reference. But vitamin deficiencies lead to problems in skin and hair, and it's all related again back to keratin, connective tissues, etc. Functional declines. These are a little bit more common and well known, but if you don't get enough vitamin K, you overbleed. We'll talk a little bit more about this. And I didn't talk a ton about vitamin K because uh, it's more pertinent in the babies lecture where we talk about nutrition for ages because they give babies vitamin K, they don't adequately produce it in their guts because oh, vitamin K stops us from bleeding if we get a cut. So anyone over the age of you know one or so, or even earlier than that, I just don't know the exact age, you cut, they clot, and that's through the function of vitamin K. It's needed for bleeding. If they don't have vitamin K or their gut isn't adequately producing it, they'll just bleed continuously. Um, we know that inadequate vitamin C creates connective tissue problems, collagen problems, which creates a condition called scurvy, um, or even something a little lighter like gingivitis, where your gums are just inflamed. And this is common. It's just related to poor vitamin C intake. Um, chelosis and other glossitis are other issues related to vitamin deficiencies and in the mouth. Inadequate vitamin A leads to a couple problems. Number one, and re prevalent in other countries, it leads to night blindness, where you can't drive at night or anything, it's brutal. Um, and also dry eye dryness, which contributes to difficulty seeing any time of day. Excess vitamin D, for whatever reason, it contributes to the overcalcification. Well, not for whatever reason, but because calcium is brought in more by the function of vitamin D, which we love about it, but too much vitamin D, too much calcium, overcalcification of certain soft tissues like kidneys. So that's why we can see kidney stones sometimes if you overdo it with the vitamin D, too much calcium in. So that's all I have, you guys. Thanks for listening to that crazy long lecture about dietary vitamins. Take care.